Good morning. Hello, everybody. Join us. We're going to start off with a song, and then we'll uh, we'll get into some more stuff. Join us in worship.
Anybody believe that? Amen. Nothing's better. I want to welcome you to Harmony this morning. Uh, if you didn't get a chance on your way in to grab a bulletin, you can grab one on your way out or sneak out and grab one during the service. Uh, has some information in there, of course. And then we have a connection card we'd like for you to fill out if you're a visitor. So we can keep up with who's here. We can get to know you and connect as well. Um, please, please focus on your worship today. It's between you and God, not between you and those around you. Um, this is where we get fed, right? This is where we come to take it in so we can take it out. All right, so let's focus on that today. Uh, and, of course, that includes our worship through song, through word, and then our fellowship as we're here at home.
Father, we thank you again for um, just allowing us to gather with all that's going on around us. Um, we thank you for the freedom we have to openly gather and worship um, Jesus Christ. And we just ask for you to um, just guide us and be with us as we move forward. And whatever we face, that we continue to worship, that we continue to have the frame of mind of, yes, I will. In the lowest valley top of the mountains that we will continue to worship you, depend on you, trust in you, and obey you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Kids, ages five through seven are dismissed. Well, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Several weeks ago, uh, you as the members here, um, officially voted in and uh, received into uh, a new season of ministry several new elders and deacons. And uh, elders and deacons are, are two groups of, of leaders that God gives to local churches like ours to, to lead and to serve. So uh, elders are, are pastors. Positionally, there's really no difference between um, an elder and, and me. Positionally, according to God's word, they're the same thing. Um, we just have a bunch of guys that do that uh, as lay elders, and I'm given the privilege of doing it full time. Uh, deacons are ministers, not ministers like, like a pastor like I am, but people that do the work of local church ministry. And I've tried to explain the, the difference between the two like this. Elders serve by leading, and deacons lead by serving. So elders have a special leadership role, and that's how they serve the church. And deacons have a special uh, service role, and that's how they lead in the church. And so before we turn our attention to God's word this morning, we want to just uh, officially pray over and commission uh, this new group of elders and deacons that God has given us. So I'd like to call all these guys up, and we'll just ask you to line up here right up front. And uh, I've asked uh, Jeff Knauer if he would come and, and just uh, pray a special prayer of, of uh, commission into this new season of ministry. All right, this is a good group of, good group of men up here. Um, as a congregation... We have a responsibility in leadership. These are the guys that uh, that are charged with exercising that uh, that leadership. But we have a responsibility in in being good followers. And so I want to reference Hebrews thirteen seventeen. It says, "Have confidence in your in your teachers and your leaders, and submit to their authority, because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account." Do this so that their will work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. Uh, so it's our job to submit to leadership. It's our job to follow in a way that makes it a joy for them to lead. And so that's what, as we pray together, that's what I'm asking you to think about. Think about the kind of follower you are, that in the body of Christ, that we submit well that it's easy for these guys to lead us well. And so in that, I would ask that everybody, let's stand. Uh, and as we pray together, uh, we're commissioning these guys. Understand that their accountability is with God. They will have to stand before the Creator and give an account of how well they led. We will have to stand before the Creator and give an account of how well we followed. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. We thank you that this morning we have the chance to, uh, to recognize these men who, who are, are willing to, uh, to submit to you in leadership. Father, we ask for wisdom, discernment, uh, for uh, shrewd minds, Lord, uh, as, as they seek to shepherd us well and to, uh, to lead us well in the, the directions that they hear you calling. 
And God, it's not that we can't go to them and disagree, but we submit ourselves to them, knowing that they have submitted themselves to you. And so, Father, ultimately, we are submitting to you in all of this. God, we pray your blessing over these men. We pray that uh, you would you would keep them, Lord, that uh, as they lead, that uh, you would keep the enemy at bay. Father, we pray for their families, that, uh, that you just watch over them also. Uh, Father, and uh, we thank you for the direction that you have laid on the heart of Harmony Church, that we as a church are, are going after you as hard as we know how. And so, Lord, again, we just pray that you would bless these men and their endeavors. And, uh, Father, help us to be great, great followers. Lord, we love you. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, it's providential, I think, that, uh, that we would follow up a time of prayer and, and commissioning into ministry with the particular sermon that we're going to look at today. We're continuing this series that we've been in called Less Than Perfect, Equipped by God When You Don't Measure Up. And uh, I know that uh, each one of these men that were up here sort of feel that way. When they read the qualifications, the very high qualifications for elders and deacons that are found in, uh, in 1 Timothy, I don't think that any of these guys were like, yep, that's me, all day long, that, that's me to the T. And that's sort of the idea behind this series, is that God oftentimes calls us to do things that we don't feel qualified for. We don't feel like we're smart enough. Maybe we don't feel like we know the Bible well enough. Maybe we think there's, there's too many issues and, and, and junk in our life to be used by God. We're not perfect. We're less than perfect. And oftentimes that creates these uh, feelings of inadequacy and fear in us. And the book of Judges has a whole bunch of stories of people that would fall into that category. Judges tells the stories of a bunch of different people that God said, hey, I've got something for you to do. Uh, I've got a mission for you to be a part of. And, and these people, every single one of them were like, me, God, really, you, you want to use me? In today's culture, we would call these people underdogs. Now, we love a good underdog story, right? Uh, college basketball is well underway. March Madness is right around the corner. And every year during the college basketball playoffs, there's, there's some underdog story, some little tiny college that, that uh, beats the odds and they beat a bunch of bigger schools and they go super far into the tournament. We love stories like that. Well, as we continue in this series today, we're going to look at an, an underdog story. And actually, this is so far beyond an underdog story, it's not even funny. Um, this is a story not of a lesser team going up against a better team. This is a story of a bunch of completely powerless people fighting against the greatest military force around. So today's story would be like a, a local youth football team of eight-year-olds playing the Carolina Panthers and actually winning. I mean, it's, it's almost impossible. So we're going to look today at the story of Gideon in Judges chapter 7. If you've got a copy of God's Word, I'll invite you to, to go to the Old Testament book of Judges chapter 7. And we're sort of picking up this story in the middle of the story. The reason that we're not starting at the beginning of the story of Gideon is because I actually preached on the beginning of the story just several months ago when we uh, regathered uh, from being online. And I don't want to re-preach that passage quite so quickly. I know you you all basically memorized my sermons, and, and it would be super boring for you. Well, here's the background of this story. Remember that the story of, of Judges is the story of God's people, the people of Israel, that were constantly getting themselves in trouble. Um, they were always turning their back on God, and, and, and so God is a way to wake them up and, and shake them out of that spiritual apathy that they were in. God would allow an, an enemy nation to overtake them and enslave them. And eventually the people would come to their senses spiritually, they'd, they'd turn back to God, they'd, raise, or they'd repent of their sin, and so God would raise up a judge. We've been saying that they're not really judges in the way that we know of judges, they're, they're more like a military deliverer that God would raise up to fight against Israel's enemies and then deliver the people. And so the book of Judges takes place over the, the span of many, many years where this cycle and pattern happened time and time and time again. And in Judges 6, we see that the people of Israel are enslaved by a group of ruthless, evil people called the Midianites. And the next judge or deliverer that God calls to free the people is this guy, Gideon. Chapter 6, Gideon's got this supernatural encounter with one of God's messengers, with an angel. 
The angel appears to him and says, God has chosen you to lead your people into fighting the Midianites. You're going to be the one, Gideon, that's going to deliver them. And Gideon's first response is basically, uh, really me? Because I'm a wimp and I come from a long line of wimps. Gideon was a bit of a coward. But eventually he says yes to God. And so we're going to pick up that story today. And specifically this morning, we're going to talk about weakness. You ever feel weak? You ever feel like you have to do something or face something that is super challenging and you, you just feel like there's no way you could ever do it? You feel weak. Well, we're going to see today why that's actually a really great place to be in life. And so here's how we're going to frame our time together this morning. We're going to talk about some things that we need to understand when God calls you to do something that's outside of your comfort zone. What do you do? What do you need to know? What needs to happen when God calls you to do something that is completely outside of your comfort zone? Some of you are there right now. Uh, maybe for some of you, God is calling you to, to lead your family through something painful and difficult, and you're like, God, I barely feel like I can get through this thing on my own, let alone lead my family through this time. Or maybe God is calling you to be uh, vocal, more vocal about Jesus at your place of employment or um, at home or with that group of friends that you hang out with. Maybe there's an area of service here at church that God is calling you to be a part of. Maybe for you, God, you, you've got a fractured relationship in your life and, and you've sensed that God is calling you to, to do your part to repair that. I mentioned last week that we are praying that 21 people in 2021 right here at Harmony uh, would take that next step of obedience and be baptized. And maybe God has been convicting you about that. Well, let's look at the story here and see what kind of wisdom that we can glean. And the first thing that we need to understand is this. When God calls you to do something that's outside of your comfort zone, it's okay to feel inadequate. All right? It's okay to feel inadequate about that calling on your life. The story starts off here, chapter 7, verse 1. It says, Jerubbabal, that is Gideon, that's his new name, and all the troops who were with him got up early and camped beside the spring of Herod. The camp of Midian was north of them, below the hill of Morah in the valley. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many troops for me to handle the Midianites, to hand the Midianites over to them, or else Israel might elevate themselves over me and say, I saved myself. God said, Gideon, if you and your army fought the Midianites right now and you won, all of Israel would think that you beat the enemy in your own strength. And they would not give me any credit. Verse 3. Now announce to the troops, whoever is fearful and trembling may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 of the troops turned back, but 10,000 remained. So Gideon announced to the army, he said, listen, God said that any of you that don't want to be here right now, you don't have to be. You can go home. And just like that, 22,000 men up and left. You think Gideon was like, God, does that include me? Can I, can I go home? Because I'd rather be home than here. Now, if you think that that didn't make sense, notice this next part. Look at verse 4. Passage continues. Then the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many troops. Take them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. If I say to you, this one can go with you, he can go. But if I say about anyone, this one cannot go with you, he cannot go. So he brought the troops down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, separate everyone who laps water with his tongue like a dog. Do the same with everyone who kneels to drink. The number of those who lapped with their hands to their mouth was 300 men, and all the rest of the troops knelt to drink water. The Lord said to Gideon, I will deliver you with 300 men who lapped and hand the Midianites over to you, but everyone else is to go home. So Gideon sent all the Israelites to their tents, but kept 300 troops who took the provisions and their ram's horn. The camp of Midian was below him in the valley. So God said, Gideon, there's still too many men. When you guys beat the Midianites, which you will, I want it to be obvious beyond a shadow of a doubt that I gave you the victory. And so I'm going to thin out the army even more. And so it does this random test that was based on how the men drank water to get rid of 97% of the rest of the men. God intentionally weakened Gideon's army. Now, there's a lot that we can learn from that. Because here's the thing, God never delights in hurting us. That is not how God operates. But sometimes, to help us learn to trust him and depend on him more, God will reduce the size of our army. What do I mean by that? 
Well, I mean that sometimes God will intentionally allow things to come into our lives that make us feel totally inadequate about our ability to handle that situation. Maybe it's a a health situation. Maybe it's a, a situation at your job. It could be something to do with your family or your marriage. If you're having issue in any of those areas right now, I'm not saying that God is absolutely behind it, but I'm saying that he might be. Sometimes God's sovereign purpose is to intentionally and yet lovingly weaken us so that we will learn to lean into him like never before. Uh, We have friends, a couple different friends, that when um, their kids were little, the kids had eye problems. Nothing major, but one eye was a little weak, and so you've probably seen this before. There's there's a a pretty easy fix for that, and and sometimes you'll see little kids that will have to wear an eye patch over their good eye, their strong eye, for a couple hours a day. And what are they doing? They're taking away the ability to, to depend on that good eye, that strong eye, so that the weak eye will get stronger. And there are times in our lives where God does that for us spiritually. If, if you're here this morning and you have been walking with Jesus for a while, I want you to think about all the times in your life that you really learned to trust in God. Maybe it was when your, your husband or your wife let you down that you learned that you could really rely on your Heavenly Father. Or maybe it was when you went through that really difficult financial time where you, you lost your job that you learned that God is your true provider. Maybe it was when that relationship completely unraveled that you learned for the first time that Jesus is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Maybe when you've been praying and praying and praying about that thing that you so desperately want to see happen in your life and it hasn't happened yet, maybe that's the time that you have never been closer to the Lord. Your weakness forced you to lean into God. See, we tend to to brag and boast about our strengths and the things that we're good at. But remember what the Apostle Paul said in Corinthians. He said, I will boast in my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. Think about how strange that is. Think about how how, how countercultural that is, that we would boast in the things that we're not good at. Guys, how many times have you ever gone into the gym and and been like, hey, just want to let everybody know, uh, I still can't bench 135. Yeah. Been lifting for a while now, still can't do it, man. Still can't, still can't bench a, a plate on each side. You'd never do that, right? Or imagine going into a job interview and the interviewer is like, so, so tell me about some of your strengths. And you're like, well, <laughs> there's really not much to talk about there. But let me tell you what I'm not good at. No, we, we'd never do that. But spiritually, feeling weak and frail is a really good thing because that's when God has the opportunity to show up in your life like no other time. And I actually think that for most of us, our strengths are more dangerous to us than our weaknesses because our strength keeps us from really trusting in God and leaning in to God. And so sometimes, because God loves us, he intentionally weakens us to bring us to that point. I love what A.W. Tozer said about this. He was an old, old-time old pastor. He's long since uh, gone to be with Jesus. But he said this, It is doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. So I want you to think about what God might be doing in your life. Maybe, maybe you, like Gideon, maybe you are experiencing a reduction in your life. Whether you are or whether you aren't, use this time to lean into God like no other time. Use this time to learn to trust him and see what God does. Well, notice how the story continues here, verse 9. It says, that night the Lord said to him, get up and attack the camp, for I have handed it over to you. But if you are afraid to attack the camp, go down with Pira, your servant. Listen to what they say, and then you will be encouraged to attack the camp. So he went down with Pira, his servant, to the outpost of the troops who were in the camp. Now the Midianites, Amalekites, and all the people of the east had settled down in the valley like a swarm of locusts, and their camels were as as, as, as numerable as the sand on the seashore. When Gideon arrived, there was a man telling his friend about a dream. He said, listen, I had a dream. A loaf of barley bread came tumbling into the Midianite camp, struck a tent, and it fell. The loaf turned the tent upside down so that it collapsed. His friend answered, this is nothing less than the sword of Gideon, son of Joash, the Israelite. God has handed the entire Midianite camp over to him. When God calls you to do something that is outside of your comfort zone, It is okay to feel inadequate because, and here's the second thing we see, 
because God will be patient with you. God will be patient with you. Isn't that good news? So, so Gideon sneaks into the Midianite camp, and he overhears a soldier talking to another soldier, and he's telling him about a dream that he just had. Now, do you see the humor in these verses? The, the picture here of Gideon coming into the enemy camp to destroy them is not a picture of a guy coming in with a sword or a spear ready to do battle, but a piece of bread rolling through the camp. That was the dream. The, the piece of bread represents Gideon. But what does the bread do? It topples over a tent. It, it does some damage. That was the weird dream that this guy had that Gideon overhears. What is God doing here? God is reassuring Gideon in his fear and in his weakness that he's going to use him, that he's going to be with him. Look at how this gives confidence to Gideon. Verse 15. When Gideon heard the account of the dream and its interpretation, he bowed in worship. He returned to Israel's camp and said, Get up, for the Lord has handed the Midianite camp over to you. I think that is so cool that God knew Gideon's bent and his proclivity to be fearful and anxious. And so as a way to reassure him, he allows Gideon to overhear this dream that gave him confidence that God was going to do what he promised. And sometimes we have this picture of God in heaven and he's a little gruff and he's a little grumpy and he's like, yeah, you mean to tell me that you don't always 100% of the time have absolute faith and confidence in me? I mean, come on, get with it. That's not how God acts toward us. That's not how God responds toward us. Several years ago, I was at a, a one-day pastor's conference and uh, and this local church brought in a, a big gun celebrity pastor. Most of you would probably know who this guy is. Been on the news a lot lately. All right, well, I won't tell you because he, he, I wasn't super impressed with him that day. Anyways, <laughs> th- this guy, he, he taught throughout the day. And at the end of the day, um, they had a Q&A time where us pastors could just ask him questions. And uh, I remember that, that this uh, younger pastor, he's probably 15 years or so younger than me, just starting off in ministry, he got up and he said, Pastor so-and-so, he said, sometimes ministry is so painful and difficult, and uh, sometimes, uh, honestly, if, if I'm honest, I, I want to quit. And he said, how have you ever dealt with times like that in your life where you've been discouraged in ministry? And man, this guy was so gruff and grumpy with him. He's like, I've, I've never dealt with that. God has called me into ministry, and I'm confident about that, and I, I rely on that, and, and that doesn't happen with me. And I think every one of us in that room were like, ouch. If, if that's really how you feel, then you're, you're beyond where we're at in ministry because we feel that way often. Aren't you glad God doesn't deal with us that way and our frailty and our weakness? We get this picture here in, in, in Judges 7 that God is, is a tender father and he's encouraging his servant. He, he's sympathetic toward his fear and his doubt. He takes time to cultivate that faith in Gideon. He's, he's patient with him. And friends, God is patient with you in your frailty and in your weakness. So when God asks us to do something that's completely outside of our comfort zone, it's okay to feel inadequate because God will be patient with us. But ultimately, and here's the third thing we need to understand, you have to step out in faith. Eventually, you just have to step out in faith. What had to happen for Gideon to be assured by God? He had to step out in faith. He actually had to sneak into the Midianite camp. And so Gideon goes back and he divides his men into into three companies of 100 men each. Remember, he's only got 300. That's the size of the army now. And he gives each man a trumpet and a jar. He tells them no swords. And he tells them to light their torches and put it in the jar. Notice what happens. Verse 17. Watch me, he said to them, and do what I do. When I come to the outpost of the camp, do as I do. When I and everyone with me blow our ram's horns, you are also to blow your ram's horn all around the camp. Then you will say, for the Lord and for Gideon. Might not needed to add that for Gideon part. Maybe just for the Lord would have been good, but whatever. Gideon's got a little swagger. He's got a little confidence now. Gideon and the hundred men who were with him went to the outpost of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch after the sentries had been stationed. They blew their ram's horn and broke the pitchers that were in their hands. The three companies blew their ram's horns and shattered their pitchers. They held their torches in their left hands and their ram's horns to blow in their right hands. And they shouted, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Each Israelite took his position around the camp. 
and the entire Midianite army began to run, and they cried out as they fled. When Gideon's men blew their 300 ram's horns, the Lord caused the men and the whole army to turn on each other with their swords. They fled to Acacia's house in the direction of Zerah, as far as the border of Abel Mahola near Tabith. Now, kind of a strange situation here. Because usually, a, a torch and a trumpet signified a whole battalion of soldiers. It would normally mean that there were thousands and thousands of soldiers ready to fight. And so Gideon gives each one of his 300 men a trumpet and a torch, and he places them around the valley where the Midianites' army was. And so the Israelites, they smashed these jars, and that would have sounded like thousands and thousands of swords being raised to fight. And they did this, it says here, at the beginning of middle watch, which means that one-third of the Midianite army was returning from camp after being on guard duty, one-third of them were getting ready to go on guard duty, and one-third of them were still fast asleep. So imagine the, the chaos when they heard all this noise from the Israelites. They, they would have thought that they were being attacked from all sides and angles. Everybody's groggy, it's dark out, some of them are sleeping, and in all the chaos, they start attacking and fighting each other. Gideon knew that God was being patient with him in his wavering faith and in his weakness and in his fear, but at some point, Man, Gideon just had to step out and risk relying on God. And that's how faith works in our life, right? When you take a step of faith in obedience, outside of your comfort zone, toward God, I think you can make the case that God takes a step toward you. Matter of fact, I want to I illustrate this. And so I'm going to ask my friend Marion if he's gonna, he would come up here and help me with this. Now, I'm not putting him on the spot. I got permission. He, he said he would be willing to help me. So Marion, here's what we're going to do. Um, in this little illustration, you're going to play the role of God, okay? I'm going to give you a God complex this morning. So I want you to come over here, and I want you to stand right there, and I'm going to stand over here, and every time I take a step toward you, you take a big step toward me, okay? And we're going to meet in the middle. So let's pretend that I'm me, and I've got something big and painful and difficult in my life, and I really need the Lord's help. I really need to sense his presence, and Marion is God, okay? And so what am I going to do when God calls me to do something outside of my comfort zone? Maybe it has to do with my job. Maybe I'm not the best person to, because my job is great, all right? I'll play you. You've got an issue with your job. And it's painful, and it's difficult. And man, you want to quit sometimes, but you're not sure if God wants you to do that. And so you, you just feel like he's calling you to do something, and it's outside of your comfort zone, and you're feeling weak and frail. What's the first thing you're going to do? For sure, you are going to take a step, and you are going to be in God's Word, all right? Every single day. You're not going to just read a little little verse, but you're going to be Bible open. You're going to be pouring over God's Word. God, give me wisdom. Help me with this, right? You're taking that step, and you're you're going to be in God's Word like no other time in your life. The second thing you're going to do is you're going to take a step, and you're going to be praying like no other time in your life. We're not talking about just a couple of little, Lord, help me today at work. Now, we're talking about on your knees, Bible open, praying through Scripture. When you get to a new level of need in your life, you've got to get to a new level of prayer in your life. And so you are praying like no other time in your life. And then maybe another thing that you do is you share what's going on in your life with some trusted friends. We're, we're not going to put this in the Harmony Happenings because this is kind of sensitive, but you've got two or three uh, trusted friends here at church, and you've asked them to pray with you specifically about your job situation You're allowing them to speak into your life. Maybe there's something that they see that you don't. You've taken some steps of obedience toward the Lord, and before you know it, man, the presence of God is so close to you that you can feel it. That even in the middle of that weakness and that that painful, difficult situation that you're going through, you know that the Lord is with you because you've taken steps toward God. Thank you. I appreciate that. And anybody that helps me with sermon illustrations on stage gets a gift, all right? Appreciate that. Now listen, <clears throat> here's what we don't mean by that. We don't mean that we work our way toward God. Right? That's not what that was about. But what, is, what does the Bible say in the book of James? That when we draw near to God, what does God do for us? He draws near to us, right? When I take a step of obedience toward God, God is going to take a step toward me. Now we would love it if God would show us the whole picture and the entire scenario all at once. 
If it was up to us, we'd say, God, okay, you're, you're calling me to do something, and I'm feeling pretty weak, and so before I obey you, I need to know all the details. You have to show me everything. We know it doesn't work that way. God will show us a little bit at a time. God develops our faith by inviting us to take our own steps of faith in the midst of our weakness. And he does that so that we will learn to depend on him. And so here is a a life-changing truth. And this is such good news if you know Jesus. Jot this down. If dependence on God is the objective, then weakness is an advantage. What what is our objective as, as Christians? What do we talk about every single Sunday here at church? What's the, the, the basically the theme of every sermon and every uh, Bible study that we do and every connection group? It's dependence on God. We want to learn to depend on God. And if that is the objective, then weakness is an advantage. See, in this story, God never explained to Gideon how to fight this battle. He didn't tell Gideon to do that thing with the, the trumpets and the, and the torches. Gideon came up with that on his own. God's reduction of Gideon's army forced him to come up with a new plan, and it was a better plan because it resulted in a victory in in which not one single Israelite died. Gideon's weakness actually became the source of his strength. Weakness was an advantage for Gideon. And friends, it's the same for you and, and for me. Weakness is an advantage in your life if it causes you to lean into Jesus because that's where real power is found. And speaking of Jesus, who else has better embodied this truth about weakness and strength than Jesus Christ? Think about the the weakness of Jesus. On the night before he was crucified, shared a meal with his disciples, and then what did he do after that meal? He washed their feet. Something that was reserved for the, the lowest of the low, the weakest of the weak. And during his trial, after he'd been arrested, he was mocked and he was beaten and he was spit upon. He was so weak that he could not carry his own cross. He had to have help. And when he hung on that cross, he died completely vulnerable with his arms stretched out. But it was through that weakness that God brought a resurrection. And man, that's that's the pattern for our lives as well. We humbly obey God and we depend on God and then God brings power and strength in our lives. And so in your weakness right now, keep, keep doing what you're doing for the Lord. Keep sharing Christ. Keep patiently parenting your kids. Keep praying for that wayward child. Keep trusting God with your job or your health or your, that, or, or your marriage or that relationship that you want to be in. If you feel weak and depleted this morning, that is the best place to be because God's power does not come through human might and strength. It comes through weakness. I'm going to ask the worship team if they'll come back up. But maybe God has been speaking to you this morning in your moment of weakness. And maybe he's been telling you today, listen, you can can trust me. I'll be your security. I'll be your provider. Maybe you've gotten to the place in your life where you've slipped back into a sense of not dependence on God, but independence. And God is impacting your heart this morning, and he's saying, listen, that's not going to end well for you. Live for me. Depend on me. I'm trustworthy. Maybe you're here this morning, and, and you've realized today that you've never actually surrendered your life wholly and completely to Jesus. Maybe you are not actually a Christian in the way the Bible would describe a Christian. In each one of these instances, God is calling you to come to him with your weakness. That's what it means to be a Christian. It means that we come to Jesus with the empty hands of faith. And we admit that we're weak. We admit that we need to be forgiven and saved. If you've never done that, you can do that right now. The good news is God uses weak people like us. And if dependence on God, if that is the objective for us as followers of Christ, then that point of weakness in your life can actually be an advantage because that's when God shows up the most. So, Father, we we need your help. Um, We admit this morning freely that we are weak people like Gideon. We're not much different than him, Lord. We've been cowards like he was a coward. But we've also seen you show up in our lives like you showed up in his life. And, Lord, I'm, I'm praying 
for my brothers and sisters that you would do that now. Lord, some in here this morning are going through painful, difficult trials in a variety of ways. And we feel weak, we feel depleted. Father, help us to see that that's the best place to be when we are at the end of our rope. That's when you can show up. So Father, I pray that you would give us the strength and the faith to take those steps of obedience toward you. Help us, Lord, to draw near to you this week and we take great comfort in the fact that you will draw near to us. We pray all these things, God, in the name of, of Jesus Christ who, although it seemed he was weak, he was incredibly strong. Amen. sing one more if you'd stand and join us. Join me in singing. He is jealous.
to be dismissed this morning with this super encouraging verse from 2 Corinthians chapter 12. It's what the Apostle Paul said. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, I will most gladly boast all the more about my weakness, so that Christ's power may reside in me. So I take pleasure in weakness, for when I am weak, then I am strong. God, we're so grateful that there are words like that that express how we feel. And so, Father, I pray this week that we would press into our weakness, that we would uh, boast in those things that (laughs) we don't feel like we're adequate in. And, Lord, I pray that when you show up in our lives like you promise you will, I pray, Lord, that we would have the faith and the confidence uh, to do what you called us to do. So we pray all these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said together, amen. Yeah.